Welcome. It's great to have you all here. And yeah, I think we have a lot of relatives of Elva Landis, but I'm just so curious. If you're a relative of Elva Landis, please raise your hand. Wow. And I heard they're, give them a hand. I heard they're from like four different counties. Um, so maybe they'll be having a, a reunion afterwards. But I know you're all gathered here um, to hear about the life and legacy of Elva Landis. I'm so thankful that Richard Weaver um, will be here to share. And then there'll be time at the end for like questions and comments. It's just great seeing all the connections. Okay, I asked about relatives. How many of you knew Elva from Tanzania? Okay, that's a lot, of, that's hands too, but not quite as many as the relatives who are here. Um, so yes, a special welcome. All right, Richard. Oh, yes, and Richard met Elva when they went to Sharadi in 1966, so, and then knew her from that time on. So, Richard, thank you for being sure. here. Thanks very much, Janice, and thanks very much for coming. I'm uh, amazed at how many Landis's, Landis relatives we have here. Of course, we live in, I thought it was Landis Valley, but it's really not. Uh, Landis Valley is in where the museum is and where the Mennonite church is, but this could be called Landis Valley the second, I guess, or something like that because there are so many Landis's here today and have been for years. Anyway, that's the story I should get on with is the story that you see uh, on, the, on the screen called in Faithful, the story of Elva Landis. This uh, book was written by her niece, Mary Charles Pepper, uh, Souter. <laughs> and I, I wanted to touch base with her a week or two ago, and I learned that she had passed away maybe a year and a half ago, which I didn't know about. And then I, of course, drove out to the farm a couple days ago. I thought I had to at least see the house up close where Elva Landis came from. And uh, then I learned that Mary Seacrest Smith, a niece of uh, Elvis, also lives here at Landis Homes. And then I saw all the others that are related to Alva. Yeah, um, the book uh, on the back, the late David Shank says, Elva. Elva had single-minded commitment to serve the Lord and the African people. She gave herself without reserve, and as far as I can recall, without complaint about the burden of the work, she was possessed with cheerful fortitude. And I love that. Dan Wenger, who's with us today, said her commitment to the people of Tanzania and the responsibility that she felt toward them was commendable. She put her all into what she did. And that is the way I experienced her and the way Ruth would have ex experienced her too. Well, back to the beginning of the story, which started in this farm that is closest to us here at Landis Homes, directly behind us, the land, the meadow is right next to Homeview Drive. The uh, land lies right next to our Layman Woods. So it's the buildings that you see, uh, and you can't see the house, only the barn and some of the other buildings. And uh, that is where Elva began her life. April 20th, 1916. I, I thought that must have been close to the time of the First World War. Indeed, it started, First World War started within a year on April 6th, 1917. 
So almost, she was almost a year old when the First World War started. She had a brother, uh, <clears throat> Jacob, and some of the relatives, and, and actually Mary is the oldest child of, of Jacob Landis. Jacob was almost exactly two years younger than Alva. And they must have been pretty close from what I gather from the book. They, uh, they frolicked a lot or played hide and seek in the woods that you see back there and probably on the land. They walked all over this land. And so the land that I can see from our cottage has become almost holy ground for me after reading the story of Alva Landis and, and, and having worked with her in Tanzania. Uh, <clears throat> she lived on this farm uh, with her family until she was about 10 years old. And then her father uh, and mother bought a farm in, in towards Landis Valley where they moved. And her father promptly began a uh, retail milk distribution business with his own cows and with neighbors' cows, as well as he developed other businesses, including feed and implements. And Elva became a very, very important part of, of his life because she was his uh, bookkeeper and looking after the records in the office. Um, <clears throat> She, uh, the family attended uh, Lannisville Mennonite Church, and um, that is probably where Alva received her first thoughts about missions. And uh, actually, it is very early that she, um, she tells Jacob, her brother, of her uh, thoughts. Um, incidentally, uh, Elva was responsible probably for uh, matchmaking of, of Mary's parents, uh, uh, Jacob and uh, Grace, uh, introducing them, and eventually they married. And, and so um, as they were dating, uh, sometime later, Elva wanted to find, how, find out how Jacob and Grace were doing. As they worked together, Elva began. You and Grace seem to be getting along nicely. Yes, Jacob responded. I think I'll stay with her if she will have me. Why don't you give Robert a chance? He has his eye on you. Now, I'm not sure who Robert was. Was that your mother's brother, Robert? Some other Robert. Some other Robert had his eye on Elva, and she says... Yes, I know, Elva sighed. If I gave him a chance, I would stay on a farm the rest of my life. <laughs> and what's so bad about that? The farm is the best place to live, Jacob says. I have heard that all my life, Elva says, but I believe the Lord is calling me to be a missionary. A missionary? You... A missionary, asked Jacob. Yes, I would like to study nursing and then go to China as a missionary, Elva responded, revealing more of her inner desires to her brother than ever before. But then she says, please don't say anything about this to anyone else in the family, especially to father. Well, how will you accomplish this? Asked Jacob in his practical way of thinking. Elva's, Elva's response. I'll take one step at a time, Elva responded. The Lord will open the doors. Well, um, <coughs> Elva made plans. She told uh, Jacob about this, uh, that she was going to take further training. Um, 
she, she said that she thinks she'll go in the fall to Eastern Mennonite School in Harrisonburg and uh, get a couple of years to prepare her for nursing school. And that is what, uh, what she did, much to her father's consternation. But actually, after the two years, uh, his, uh, he and his wife um, went, were down for, for the graduation. At the, and the, then uh, in the summer of 1941, Elva was invited by a Catherine Landis to work for a Quaker family in Coatesville. And when she uh, worked there, she fa uh, found out that the, the woman of the house, the Quaker woman's sister, was actually a physician at Women's Hospital in Philadelphia, which would have been uh, later the women's medical school and hospital, uh, which started about 1850. Anyway, um, the rest is history. The women's hospital was a place that Alva would, would do her nurse's training and graduate from there in 1945. But she, didn't ha she did not have enough training at that. She chose to go to, to the University of Pennsylvania for two more years to get her Bachelor of Science in nursing. In that spring of 1948, she received a postcard from none other than her father's second cousin, Ara Landis, um, saying that he wanted to speak to her, her next trip home. And Ara Landis, as I mentioned, was the second cousin of her father, lived on the farm across from the east entrance of Landis' home. And Ara was part of the Eastern Mennonite Board of Missions and Charities. And so when she finally got home, it wasn't just Ara Landis, but also Henry Garber with him, saying, we at the mission board, oh, after normal pleasantries, Ara Landis began. began. <clears throat> The mission board is looking for nurses to serve in Tanganyika, Africa. Excuse me. For years, I've felt the call of God to mission work, Elva responded. But I believe I'm to serve in China. Henry Garber continued. We at the Mission Board are aware of the opportunities around the world. Presently, China is not open to new missionaries. In fact, all the missionaries in China are being required to leave because of the communist takeover. We would like you to prayerfully consider a five-year term as a missionary nurse at the Shirati Hospital in Tanganyika, Ara explained. I will consider it, Elva replied, awed that she was being asked by the mission board to serve in Africa. As Elva prayed and considered that the door to China was closed, she was sure God was calling her to accept this open door to Africa. On her next trip home, she told her parents, I have some, something very important to tell you, Elva began. I have been asked by Ara D. Landis and Henry Garber to serve a five-year term as a missionary nurse in Tanganyika. I have prayed about it and believe that that is where God wants me to go. She's 32 years old. Her father said, why would you want to go to Africa? Are there not enough needy people in America? Swallowing hard, Elva replied, I have already promised that I would go. And her father said, do what you want. You will anyway. 
but I want you to know that I'm not in favor of it. First, you go against my wishes by taking nurses' training, and now you plan to go to Africa without consulting me. With that, Henry walked out of the room. Elva's mother looked at her with understanding in her eyes, but said nothing. Well, there's a picture of her in those years. And as a graduate nurse, 1945. So by <clears throat> February 19th, 1949, she was on the Queen Elizabeth for Southampton, from New York to Southampton. And on board was our, our own Dan Wanger with his mother and two siblings. And that's a story in itself that should be told someday too. Dan's mother, who became a widow on their first, on their first uh, trip to Africa when Bishop Wanger died of uh, complications of malaria, here, Miriam Wanger is with her three children, three children, heading back to Africa by herself, yeah, with her children. Such commitment we're talking about. Anyway, um, that ship, the Queen Elizabeth, as you know, was a, one of the largest ships ever built. It was over a thousand feet long. 1,031 feet, something like that, carried 2,200 or more passengers. And they went to, to uh, Southampton from New York, where they spent a number of days in, in London. And then the, uh, the Wanger family and Elva were off on a Holland African line ship from Southampton down around Africa, down around the Cape up the east coast of Africa to, to Dar es Salaam, where they would have gotten the train uh, to, to, uh, to Mwanza in the interior. At this point, I need to explain. I don't have, you know, sir, it's a picture, I think. Um, the picture is not uh, large enough for you to actually see, so I'll, I'll explain to you. Um, the two places that uh, Elva would have served was the one where Ruth and I and our children lived, and others from here have spent time, Shirati Hospital, which is on Lake Victoria in northwest Tanzania. There's another station that was developed, and there were four or five stations actually in the area where early missionaries were, including the Wanger family at another station. But the place that Alva would serve most of her years was about uh, 50, 60 miles from Shirati, east of Shirati, uh, and it was on a table land, you might say, a mountain with a flat top, this 20, 30 mile long mountain with, with a flat top where the Kuria people lived and where they farmed. And it was actually far, excellent farming because it was uh, fertile and, uh, and, the, uh, and probably got more rain. It was a thousand or two feet higher than the surrounding uh, plateau. And uh, on that plat on that high plateau, on that tableland, is where the one of the stations, Niabasi, was uh, uh, formed early in the in the 30s, also among the Kuria people. And this this is very near to the Kenya border, so uh, the Kuria people lived 
right next to the Maasai people who were in Kenya. And I think there must have been skirmishes sometimes between, I know that there were, between the Maasai and the Kuria. And I'm sure that Elva must have taken care of some injured uh, people from skirmishes because the the Maasai people uh, felt that God had given them all the cattle of the earth and it was just theirs to, to get them. And so there was a lot of uh, attempts at stealing cattle. And I, I know I took care of at least one fellow who had uh, multiple arrows in his uh, chest, uh, a poor Korea fellow who, who uh, uh, his shield didn't work. <laughs> well, Elva served for three years at Shirati, and this would have been before there was a nursing school there. So she wouldn't have taught nursing at that point, but uh, wherever Elva was, she was a teacher too. So I'm sure she was teaching uh, Africans during those three years that she was at Shirati. It was only in the early 60s that a, a nursing school would be developed. And actually, Elva, always seeking further education, uh, took a year and went to uh, Edinburgh, Scotland to get a year of midwifery training. Um, and this, yeah, this would have been about five years before we even arrived. Um, <clears throat> so she would have taught eventually some in the nursing school. But uh, after three years, uh, uh, that is from 49 to 52, after that in the 52, Dr. Noah Mack and Muriel, who were serving at Niabasi, uh, and, and where Lucille Stolzfus, who lives here, was born. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Noah Mack came to Alva and said, we are going home for furlough. We think you could manage this hospital or this uh, outstation. This, it was a clinic and actually a small hospital. And Alva considered, considered it, and indeed, for the next three years, she served as, uh, as the only, only um, physician, really, at, at, at uh, Niabasi. And uh, as I mentioned, that's where she would spend then most of the rest of her life, though she was at Shirati a number of times, and indeed was at Shirati on, uh, certainly on the airstrip when Ruth and I and our 18-month-old son uh, landed there in August of 1966. Incidentally, our son is married to our, our chaplain here at Landis Homes. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, Elva was there to receive us, and it wasn't long maybe uh, within a week or two that I heard a high-pitched voice outside uh, our house, maybe at midnight one night, and the voice was saying, Dr. Weaver, I have a patient that needs a C-section. And I said to myself, well, I wonder what she knows about it. And I soon learned that Elva knew a lot more about obstetrics than I did. And whenever she called for a C-section, I went in haste and did it for her. And uh, we always did have a, a very good relationship. After um, five years, uh, Elva did have a chance to come home for a furlough. And again, seeking education, just amazing to me, uh, I think to us. She promptly drives her Pontiac, I believe they called it a pony. She drives her Pontiac to Loma Linda, California, where she goes to the Hospital of Medical Evangelists, and it became a medical school for 
medical evangelists started by the uh, Seventh-day Adventists. Anyway, she went there for a course in tropical medicine. From there, she went to, to uh, Tulane in New Orleans for a course in bacteriology and parasitology so she could diagnose parasite, parasitic diseases or teach one of her clinic workers how to look at people's stools and come up with what parasites were afflicting them. So she did that course at Loma Linda, which is now Loma Linda University. And from there, as I mentioned, she went to Tulane where she had the parasitology and bacteriology. But from there, she went to uh, Carville, the place of the only leprosarium in our country. And she wanted to get a couple weeks of training in, le in leprosy work. And uh, actually, her parents, realizing they might not get to see her much, actually drove to New Orleans to see her while she was down there for that course. She came back and then went to Temple University in Philadelphia for some further training for several weeks. And after that, she spent a summer at Eastern Mennonite College for a summer Bible courses. She was planning then to be a career missionary with all the training she had. I mean, what can, what can you uh, <clears throat> say? Um, well, after five years, she, she was back on the Queen Elizabeth a second time for Southampton again. As you know, the Queen Elizabeth went one direction while the Queen Mary was going the other direction. They did that for quite a number of years, of course. So she's, on the, she's getting on the Queen Elizabeth in New York a second time. And her father says to her, I think this will be your last term in Africa. Well, Elva would serve uh, nine more terms in Africa after that. But her parents visited in 1958, uh, a year or two after she was back for her second term. And uh, there was no further word from her father after that visit uh, about uh, returning home. I think he saw, too, that she was needed and doing a, a fantastic job there. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I, I want to say that Elva's particular interest was in seeing healthy babies born. She th was thrilled with helping babies to make it. And she wrote home about the twins, the triplets, and I believe maybe quads one time. But she uh, helped these little, even prematures, to make it. They were two and a half, three pounds, and not strong enough even to, to breathe maybe on their own. And, they, and she would, they would use a, a, a bag to breathe for them until they were able to do so. But they would put a feeding, she would put a feeding tube in the stomach. And then often she would, maybe with Mary Harnish, they would take turns keeping a hot water bottle warm because there were no incubators she would keep hot water bottles beside these babies so they could maintain their temperature themselves. And, uh, and many of these little prematures also made it because of Elva's careful ministrations to them and Mary Harnish and others. But 
I'm sure that Alva was teaching other African nurses and so forth too how, how to care for these little ones. As you might suspect, there were sometimes orphan children. There were children, uh, sometimes twins even. And in Africa, in certain of the, some of the cultures in Africa, twins were not necessarily a blessing. They were often considered to be a curse. And one or both of them were sometimes left out in the wilderness to, to die. Well, uh, Elva actually uh, raised a pair of, of twins. A mother came back a year later with another to deliver another baby, and uh, Elva offered her the twins. And she said, no, I have enough children. Uh, you keep the twins. And Elva raised, raised the twins and many others. And in the back of this book, there is a whole page of, of uh, Elva's descendants, children's and grandchildren. And I'm sure today, uh, almost 15 bit years since the book was written, there are probably great grandchildren and maybe two pages of her de descendants in Africa. Elva as I said, was a teacher wherever she went. She, when I made rounds with her at Niyabasi, uh, I would go up from Shirati to Niyabasi. Um, Dr. Hausman would go sometimes and I would alternate with him. And that is Miriam Hausman's husband, who of course he's no longer living, Miriam is. But we would, we would, um, take turns going up and making rounds once a month at, uh, at Niyabasi. And um, you could tell that Alba was forever teaching her African uh, colleagues uh, this and that about patient care and so forth. But more than that, she eventually uh, taught students from Eastern Mennonite College, nursing students went over for for six weeks at a time. My own niece was one of her students that uh, lived with her, and she would have them live right in her house with her. She lived in the, in the larger house where, where Dr. Mack and Muriel had lived, uh, and uh, was uh, large enough for her to accommodate uh, nursing students. And of course, she would have house help to look after guests, and Elva had a lot of guests. Uh, people from here, and some of you, I'm sure, Mary, you were there a number of times probably to see her. How many of you were over to see uh, Elva Landis at some time or another? Mary, you were, weren't you? OK. Um, but uh, other people, I know that my own wife's uh, aunt and uncle uh, who learned to know our guests at EMC. They were from Oklahoma and they had been to Malawi to see their own daughter and then stopped in Nairobi and in Tanzania to see Elva Landis. But Elva cared for these people and when, uh, for instance, in 67, um, <clears throat> Elva was still at Sharati and Ruth was in Nairobi to give birth to our second child because uh, I was by myself and I didn't want to have to do a cesarean if necessary on my own wife. So I sent her off to Nairobi and Elva's house hand and Elva took care of me with a lot of, lot of meals, um, breakfast and so forth. and, and um, yeah, uh, I remember being late for some of those meals. One day I was late because of surgery took longer. The next day I remember uh, I was off from surgery, so I took a motorcycle the 35 miles to Tarimi to get the mail. And uh, here I was coming towards Shirati and 
I was late again for lunch and feeling badly and, and opened up the motorcycle a little faster than I should have when a cow went across in front of me and I hit the cow on the side. Fortunately, I was, the motorcycle fell over but, and I was fine except for a few scuffs. Anyway, Alva reprimanded me for hurrying back on the motorcycle. <laughs> She said, you could be late one more time. That would have been fine. <laughs> um, I'll tell this story yet, and then I'll open it up for any of your comments or questions. Um, <clears throat> you know, in, in uh, 1972, when we went back, uh, for our second term after first year, after being home for two years, I finished my surgical training and needed to do my board exams, which were proctored in Beirut, Lebanon. So I, I flew to Beirut, Lebanon in the fall of 1972. And um, <clears throat> unknowns to me, uh, Alva and Ruth and our two oldest children headed for uh, Mombasa and the Indian, and the Indian Ocean, um, where they were going to spend a few days. Uh, and while there, and I'll read uh, my wife's story, vacation on the Indian Ocean beach was very enjoyable, but, but almost tragic for Alva. I'm sorry. Ruth Weaver explained, <clears throat> at low tide, one could walk quite a distance from the shore to a coral reef and find many fascinating formations and stones as well as, or as, and shells as well as fish life. It was one afternoon when Alva had been out alone and was returning with the incoming tide when she began to cross a shallow depression in the sand. But because of the tide that had already preceded her, she did not recognize that she was wading in a, into a deep depression. She thought and said that she had remained out too long and that the tide was overwhelming her. In the midst of her struggle, she told me later, she promised God that if he would spare her life, she would serve him all her days in Africa. And eventually she did strike firm footing and return to us looking quite bedraggled. This was a pivotal experience for her and she always thought of it whenever she considered retiring and she told people that God was faithful to her. And she served another 24 plus years at Niambasi until she broke her hip in 1987, went to Nairobi and had that repaired. And in 1996, nine years later, she had a stroke when she had to come home and Viral, is Viral Roof? <laughs> Viral Rufinak can tell us how he helped her to get to Nairobi where her younger brother Ara and his wife Ruth met her and uh, brought her home. She didn't really want to come home as people suggested earlier. She said, there aren't many babies born at Landis Homes. <laughs> There's no maternity department here. So uh, she really wanted to die in Africa, I think. And, um, but uh, Ara and Ruth brought her home and in a short while she was here in uh, Landis Homes where I visited her a number of times and every time I saw her, she was sitting at a sewing machine with her left hand, her non-dominant arm, hand, and putting together quilt tops, four or five a week. 
uh, uh, faithfully still committed to helping others. That's my story. <laughs> and uh, Janice will have the a phone, or a yeah, microphone for those that might have questions. Verl, you want to say something, maybe? Actually, uh, Elva was born, or went to Tanzania before I was born. So, but I did get to know her. Um, and I'll tell you maybe two things. In 1982, I traveled with her to and from Tanzania on home leave. And I was from Ohio. I did not know Landis Holmes. But Elva and I got in a lim limousine at the Lancaster Airport to go to JFK. And of course, we went past Landis Holmes. And I did not, I had heard of Landis Holmes. I was in the front with the driver. She was in the seat behind me. She leaned up and told me, she said, I was born there and that's where I'm going to die. And I did not know that she would actually die here, but she did. Elva's wish was that she would die in Tanzania. I was the missionary rep for many years in Tanzania. And in the file, I had what, she, what we were to do with all of her earthly possessions that she had in Tanzania. And I knew where that was located. Little did I realize that I would be the one who would have to deal with that. It was on August the 17th, I believe, a Saturday afternoon. I heard a holy or a knock on the door from the doc, and it was the doctor who was, work or the clinical officer who was working with Elva at the time, saying Elva was in the hospital, she had a stroke and could not talk. She was 80 years old at that time. So I went up to see her, and we determined that she probably needed to get home. Well, we were in Africa. We didn't have telephones. We didn't have anything. The only thing I knew to do was to get on a ham radio and send out an SOS, and someone answered. We gave them the phone number of Harold Reed and asked that he get on the phone, on the ham radio with, I think, probably Bob Hauser that evening. And we told him what had happened to Elva and made arrangements. He would talk to the family um, to see what could be done. And then we got, probably got on the ham radio the next day or something, I don't remember. So Elva, you know, was in the hospital, unable to talk at that point. She did start to talk a bit, but she was not walking or anything. So we had decided that we would send her by MAF to Nairobi, Kenya. Before she went to Nairobi, I actually went up and cleaned up her house. It, I did it within a day's time, and it was easy because I knew exactly what to do with all of her things. And some of her friends who from up there helped to do this as well. Well, the MAF plane came. She still could not walk or do anything. I had to physically lift her into the plane. Another nurse, Velma Schrock, flew with her to Nairobi to meet Ira and Ruth there. So I always felt bad. I was the one who sent her home when I knew she did not want to go, but I did not know what to do with an 80-year-old lady who could not talk or walk at that time. And we certainly did not have physical therapy there at Shirati. Thanks, Earl. <clears throat> Dick mentioned our family traveling to Tanzania with Elva back in 49. Elva was a lady who did not let gender stop her from doing things that a lot of people would have said isn't her kind of work. It was either the summer of 50 or 51, the missionaries had a conference together at Shirati, and those of us who lived 50 miles or more south across the Mara Bay and River had to go over a, by a ferry across the other side of the bay and be met by a vehicle there. Well, the truck that the mission had at the time was an old army vehicle and apparently there was no mail available to drive that truck from Shirati the 50 miles to Kinesi to meet those we missionaries who were headed for the conference. Elva drove it and we kids were so amazed. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> All right. 
Okay, who's next? Maybe I should come over towards the family, see if you have some stories. <clears throat> Anybody? Mary, did you have something? I'm trying to decide. <laughs> I just want to say I was about seven years old when Ian Alba went over to Africa the first time. And as, as Richard mentioned, uh, Jacob was my father. And Ian Alba was very faithful in writing, but it took a while for the mail to get back and forth. And it was, so all of my life, it was anticipating when she was going to be coming home for furlough. and. One of the things that my grandparents did, they did a lot of entertaining. And if there was a missionary from Tanzania that was home on furlough, they'd have them and invite their children, which would include the grandchildren, of course. And so we had a lot of contact with missionaries. I have a picture of Dan that I'd like to show sometime of when, well, it probably was 48. Well, sometime when you were home before you went back. Um, in my grandparents' living room there with my family and my extended family. Um, and so it, it was a special blessing to expose us to all the missionaries from especially um, Tanzania. And I'm thankful for that. Thanks very much, Mary. Oh. I wanted to say that we have gathered here to have memories of Elva Landis oh, and uh, even as we honor her and her life, she would certainly want us to give all honor and glory to God. That's who Elva was. So let us remember that, that we honor God because of Elva. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Of course, I don't remember this, but I'm told that Aunt Elva delivered me as a baby. Oh, wow. <clears throat> nephew. I, I was a nephew. I wonder how many babies she delivered in her life. Um, just amazing, you know. Uh, yeah, and she had served at Niabasi where the roads were often very bad so bad that even the buses couldn't get through. And, and she, she had to do what doctors did. And uh, I don't think she ever did a cesarean section, but she did other things to make it. She used the vacuum extractor, which I was able to get her, uh, which was better than forceps for delivering babies. And she used that extractor. and and another procedure that I was able to teach her to make it possible for women to deliver. I guess she I was on furlough when you were born. She was on furlough or you were in Africa? <laughs> okay. Any other? Okay. Well, uh, I have a few more pictures here. Uh, let's take this comment and then I'll just uh, go through the these a little rapidly. And if I say your name. My name is Lucille Stolzfus, Max Stolzfus. Oh, yeah. And Lucy. I lived in the same. I was born at Trotty Hospital, at, I mean at Trot, excuse me, at Neabasi in 1940. And when I was 50 years old, my mother, my sister, and I went back to Niabasi to help celebrate the 50-year anniversary of Niabasi. And at that time, we stayed with Elva. And um, I remember it was real special seeing her with all these 
little children even then coming and going, um, some that she had adopted. When I was born, the clinic had just been finished but didn't have the doors on yet. And so Africans would come in and go out to see this first white baby that had ever been born in that area. And so uh, I remember Alba, she was really a lovely person. Well, Lucille, yeah, your parents lived at Niabasi, I believe in 1940 to 1952, during which time you were born there. And uh, as you told me, if you don't mind, the, uh, the people came to see this newborn baby, even a, a man with a long spear, and stood there uh, to observe this new white baby. He meant no harm. But uh, Muriel, her mother, uh, Lucille's mother, said it's now time to get doors on the, on the house. <laughs> Dr. Yes. Noah Mack, another person that I would honor if I knew all the story, but uh, he was honored actually by the Queen of England for his work in Tanzania. Um, yeah, go ahead, Burl. <clears throat> Just one more story. Elva educated a lot of people, and I know of at least nine students that she educated either at Sharadi Nursing School or some other place, and I taught several of them. I maintain contact with some of them. One of them is no longer a nurse, but uh, his name Musa Marwa. He heads up the Bible College in Tanzania, and at one time had been the, execu or the assistant executive secretary for the Mennonite Church in Tanzania. So I do have contact with some of them, and it was just the other day we were talking about Elva when she had her stroke because some of these people were with her. I think I saw another hand too, right here. Ruth Weaver, just to say, all the nurses that were over there maintained medical white clothing, and they were usually very, very well dressed. Elva, never anything out of place. Always a starched, fresh uniform. And her her cap. hat, her cap, I mean, her shoes, and that, all that mud up at, at Niavasi, she was always in pure white. Thanks, Ruth. I forgot to mention that. This is the maternity ward at Shirati. I don't know how it shows up. Um, sorry about the, these are just pictures from, from the book. Um, there's Alva with twins. Uh, the pharmacy at Niabasi. There is the graduating class in Edinburgh, Scotland. And I told somebody here that you could borrow the book and it could be passed around. I think there's one in the library in Harvest View also. Um, but uh, as long as I get it back and I have my name on it, you're welcome to, to borrow this. So there's her parents with her, and I believe your Aunt Emma, she's no longer living, I assume. Um, there's Alva on the, I believe, on the Sharati airstrip with uh, Naomi Weaver, who is also lives here, another faithful uh, spirit, faithful and, um, and uh, you know, Cora Lehman and Alta Weaver, who lived here till she passed away. Um, there is Alva again. And this is Niabasi. Uh, in the foreground would be the children's school. Uh, in the background up on the hill is the uh, clinic building. This is all on top of that escarpment, the high tableland that I was talking about. Uh, the church at Niabasi. Uh, Alva's home at Niabasi. Um, There's Alva with one of her or children there, Daniel, I believe. There's Alva as I saw her here at Landis Homes during those years from, say, in 96 to 2003 when she passed away. Anyway, these are missionaries from, I guess, Tanzania who are honoring Alva 
as she was honored also by the Tanzanian leaders when they came and visited after that. Any other comments, question? I think that this, this song would summarize for me uh, what Alva would want us to know. God leadeth me, O oh blessed thought, O oh words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's bowers bloom, by waters calm or troubled sea, still tis his hand that leadeth me. Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur, nor repine, content whatever lot I see, since tis my God that leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory won, even death's cold wave, I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me. By his own hand, he leadeth me. His faithful follower, I would be, for by his hand, he leadeth me. Can we sing a verse? <laughs> the first verse. He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught. He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I Still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me. By his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful heart for by his hand he Thank you so much, Richard. Um, yeah, this is just really meaningful to hear about her life. I had met her just because of working here when she lived here, but I didn't know all the history. So a big thank you, Richard, for taking time to share and present, and to all of you who shared, and just being here, being present to share in this time together. So let's, let's give Richard a hand. Thanks so much. All right, and maybe thanks you'll continue coming. to have stories. So, all right, yes, thanks so much for coming. <laughs>